Well, thank you very much. And uh, let me start by thanking the Carter organisers for inviting me to this very distinguished and uh, marvellously exciting um, symposium. And let me secondly say what a very silly question you've asked us to address, <laughs> as has already been pointed out. Is the human mind unique? Well, of course it is unique, as is the minds of all other uh, animals. Not only that, but all other individuals as well. And on this particular picture, we can recognise some individuals there, not, but not others. But we must remember when we're talking about chimpanzees or Neanderthals I'm talking about, there is a dimension of individuality going across which we must somehow have to bring into our consideration. So the minds of all of these uh, individuals and species are unique. And the way that we can explore what specific aspects make the human mind different, what are its only unique ways, is through the comparative method. So we have to ask questions of comparison. And the first one we must ask is, what is the difference here? Well, here we have two representatives of the Homo sapiens and Pan troglodytes, and ask, what is the difference between them? Well, quite easy to answer. There's about 1,000 cc of brain matter and about 6 million years of evolutionary divergence. It's fairly straightforward. And what has that um, resulted in? Well, has resulted in this particular chimpanzee still living in the <laughs> West African forest, but Professor Humphrey residing for at least a few days in San Diego in an environment entirely different to that of his evolutionary ancestors, whereas this chimpanzee is living in an environment which is broadly quite similar, and we suspect that he or she is behaving in a fairly similar way. So the bigger brain provides language, high orders of intentionality, abstract thought, cumulative culture, and so on and so forth. It could be a whole variety of things, OK? Let's go to a much more difficult and, for me, a much more interesting question. What is the difference between these two? Here's another representative of Homo sapiens and a representative of Homo neanderthalensis, so a reconstruction of a particular individual from a particular skull, somebody whose identity we do not know, and there we have Professor Dan Dennett representing the human race for us. <laughs> what is the difference between them? Not very much. If we, look at their, uh, if we look at their brains, for instance, broadly the same size. And now, if you took body weight into comparison, you might say the Homo sapiens brain is slightly larger, but not so much that we can easily come to a ready answer that the difference in brain is resulting in the very different qualities. And here, of course, remember, we're talking about different types of humans. So go back to the question, is the human mind unique? Well, what sort of human? Homo sapiens, Homo gaster, Homo erectus, Homo hylobagensis. There's lots of different types of humans. So the question is not, I think what the question we weren't addressing is, is a human mind, brain unique, but is Homo sapiens mind unique? So the, looking at the difference between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens is much more challenging because we haven't got the easy answer of a grossly different uh, brain size. Now, let me just remind you that Neanderthals are uh, a very recent um, relative of ours, uh, an offshoot at about 300,000 years ago on that um, uh, line there leading to, to modern humans. Became extinct about 30,000 years ago after having been a remarkably successful species for more than 200,000 years. And doing since their remains were first discovered in the late 19th century, there's been well-documented swings of opinion regarding the Neanderthals. Uh, Marcel Boulle here we see re reconstructed in 1909, rather brutish, savage Neanderthals. Yeah, and there on your, on your right we have a rather more 20th century version of the, of the Neanderthals, very much like me and you, although they uh, enjoy uh, nudity, or perhaps rather more than we do, or rather more than some of us at least. Uh, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, a highly, a highly social, intelligent species, no doubt. So, archaeologists and others have the task of trying to reconstruct what the Neanderthal mind may have been like, with one view of trying to understand is there any difference between Neanderthal mind and that of Homo sapiens, although looking at the Neanderthal minds for their own sake is a, is a perfectly um, good and valid enterprise. And we draw on archaeological evidence for looking at behavioural change, 
We look at fossil evidence for looking at the size of the cranium. And then we have to engage with a whole wealth of other disciplines, comparative psychology and ethology, social anthropology, neuroscience, genetics, and so on and so forth. And when archaeologists refer to mind, they tend to use it as a, a catch-all term, not really knowing what philosophers are talking about when they talk about the philosophy of mind. Intelligence, emotion, memory, planning, learning, and so on and so forth. So being rather unspecific. Now what I'd contend is that if we look at the actual record and the fossil record, in as much detail as we can, we can see eight reasons for suspecting there were very minimal differences between the Neanderthal and the modern mind. And therefore, if we are unique, we're not unique by very much at all. There is, for instance, the close evolutionary relationship. We shared an ancestor no more than 500,000 years ago. Is that time for significant differences in cognition to have evolved? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. We know now there's some degree of interbreeding happening between Neanderthals and modern humans. We know, I've already referred to the similarity in brain size. And looking at the vocal tract, there's no reason to uh, infer any significant differences in the capacity for vocalisation from anatomy alone. Uh, further reason, my number five, is simply looking at the complexity of the Neanderthal stone tool technology, uh, especially the Lavalwatik, that technique we see here. Neanderthals were routinely shaping blocks of stone using immense skill and foresight so they could remove large flakes, large blades, and in this case, a point perfectly ready to be hafted for use. It is extraordinary skillful activity. Very few modern flintknappers who acquire these ancient arts are able to replicate what the Neanderthals were doing on a routine basis. So it seems most likely to me they must have involved some active teaching, vertical, horizontal, and oblique, coming across generations. And then further, we need to remember that the Neanderthals were um, an extraordinarily successful species. Now, if Homo sapiens last 200,000 years, I'd be surprised the way we're going to this planet. <laughs> and Neanderthals made it. They lasted two, maybe 300,000 years. Not only that, during that period of time, the global climate swung from ice age to interglacial and back to glacial period. They were present all the way from the uh, Atlantic coast right through into Central Asia at Tasik Tash, uh, inhabiting a very diverse range of environments. What a clever species to have done that and survived such enormous climate change that is doing such devastating consequences to our societies at present. Now, partly doing that, they were outstanding hunters. We know by looking at their skeletal remains, doing some very clever isotope studies, that, they, that meat played a very high role in their diet. They hunted big game, often using spears, short thrusting spears, and that would have required cooperation, a lot of planning, and for me, most important, a lot of trust between individuals. This isn't hunting like a social carnivore, like a, like, like a chimpanzee. This is a, this is a much more sophisticated group hunting, I think. So this begins to us thinking about not only their technical skills and their natural history knowledge, but also their social skills. And when we look at um, aspects of their sociality, Again, we're drawn to thinking that the similarities with modern humans, homo sapiens, are far more profound than the differences. Now, some would argue that if you look at brain size within in primates, it broadly correlates with levels of social intelligence, however that might be defined, such as empathy. And if that's the case, Nyantas would have the same levels of social intelligence as we have. But we can also look at the social care of the individuals. They were burying uh, some individuals, some who got wounded and injured were clearly cared for and back to health. We cannot avoid the conclusion that the Neanderthals showed great deals of empathy, great deals of social care. We can't avoid that they are much like us in those regards. So I've given you eight different eight reasons why the Neanderthal mind and the Homo sapiens mind appears almost identical. Here's three differences why they seem just absolutely radically different. And I've listed them here. I'll go through them in a little bit more detail. Cultural homogeneity versus cultural change, rapid replacement, and the absence of symbolism. Let's look at the first of those. Now, throughout the two or 300,000 years of their existence, Neanderthals remained as Stone Age hunter-gatherers in restricted regions of the world. In this picture on your 
left, you'll see the um, deep sequence at Taboon Cave in, in Israel, which stretches for about 200,000 years. You can take the artefacts at the base of that sequence and reconstruct the way of life at the base of that sequence. It's not, much, it's not different in kind from that at the top. Remarkable stability. Through all those climate changes, through all the demographic changes, much the same going on. And there on, the, on, the, um, on your right... Where is that? I think that's Tokyo, is it? I'm not quite sure. But anyway, what we're seeing, what we're seeing here is in merely the 200,000 years at most that modern humans have survived, and most of this activity has happened in the last 10,000 years, we have radically changed the way we live. So, so we've got a globalised climate now with megacities and, and so forth. Radically different type of species, radically different type of mind. And we can see that if you look more detailed. So if we look at these stone artefacts... Neanderthals made very few technical innovations. They changed the types of tools, they responded to raw materials, but the amount of innovation is limited. Among modern humans, after an admittedly slow and bumpy start, by the time you get to around 50,000 years or so ago, you see innovation after innovation after innovation. Things such as sewing needles, fantastic in the middle of a glacial period. Neanderthals didn't, Neanderthals didn't invite sewing needles to improve their clothing, or harpoons, and so on and so forth. Now, we know from the Neanderthals, from their skeletal remains, they were on just on the edge of existence. They, there was never a population, I think, under more uh, adaptive stress than Neanderthals. Why the heck didn't they invent some tools to help themselves out? Why didn't they invent some bow and arrows, some spear throwers, <laughs> some needles? It's ridiculous, OK? <laughs> and why didn't they invent farming? Now, here's a, here's a more interesting question. Um, Homo sapiens dispersed out of Africa around 50,000 years ago. The very first time an interglacial came along, they invented farming. Not just in one place, but in eight or nine different places in the world. And that led to the early civilizations and San Diego. OK? <laughs> it just happened. Now, look at this chart. You see the Neanderthals. They hit interglacial, they hit interglacial, they hit interglacial. They carried on doing much the same. Why is it modern humans just responded to the interglacials in that manner and the Neanderthals didn't? May must be something to do with the reason that Neanderthals were so rapidly replaced by modern humans in Europe. Modern humans dispersed into Europe around 40,000 years ago. Within five, 6,000 years, Neanderthals have been pushed to the margins and then faded into extinction. Yes, there may have been a little bit of interbreeding, there doesn't seem to be any violence and warfare and so forth, but the Neanderthals were edged out by ecological competition. There was a species that lived in there, in that low landscapes, for more than 100,000 years. They were adapted to those particular environments. In come these Africanists, these Homo sapiens. Within a few thousand years, they had the land world to themselves. Why was that? And then we have the issues of symbolism. Here we have a, um, just some reminders here. Here we have the uh, Red Cross for first aid. I think it's entirely arbitrary. We have icons and indexes. No doubt animals, no doubt Neanderthals were using things like footprints and fire to make associations with future events. They're not symbols. Um, for, for us, everything and anything might have symbolic meaning, such as the red rose, a symbol of love, which reminds me I spent Valentine's Day flying across the Atlantic rather than going out for dinner with my wife. But, uh, <laughs> but there we go. Such is science. Now, the Neanderthals, there's been lots of claimed visual symbols for the Neanderthals, things such as Chateaupronian artefacts. The archaeologists among you will know the many pages and pages of debate that have gone on about whether Neanderthals made these pendants and beads or whether they just found them or whether they invented them by copying humans. Terrible debate. I don't think it's got us anywhere. I, personally, I don't think they made them. I think that it's interstratified inter mixing within deposits. They may well have pierced some shells, some contentious evidence on that, and there's a few little bones with scratches on, but there's no repeated iconography at all. They certainly buried some of their dead, but I don't think burial is a symbolic act. It's simply an act of loving and uh, caring for individuals. And there's some claims the Antiles use pigments. There's getting quite strong claims now. From France, it's a black pigment, manganese, manganese oxide, and um, whether they're using that for... Um, Symbolic decoration is not contentious. Zihau, an archaeologist, he argues from some evidence from Spain 
that are found on these shells, that Neanderthals, they were engaged in body painting. And the distinguished proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, published this article recently, appearing very assertive that Neanderthals were symbolically organised throughout the lives right to the very end. I think this is one of the most appalling statements published in an academic journal because I think, the, uh, I think the evidence for this is absolutely limited, ambiguous, and I think it's shameful it's been published in that manner. But the Neanderthals may be body painting. If they were, I don't think it's necessarily symbolic. Neanderthals on the modern mind. I've given you eight reasons for minimal difference. They're very closely evolution related to us. Some interbreeding going on, we don't know how much. They had large brains. Modern vocal tract. They're technically complex, ecologically sustainable, fantastic hunting and social skills. In all that regard, would say their minds can't be very different from our minds. And yet we have almost the exact opposite message coming from other aspects of the Arctic record. This remarkable cultural homogeneity, this rapid replacement, and then the absence of symbolic behaviour. So how do we explain the differences? Well, if we, I'd argue that there are, in fact, Three key differences, big differences, massive differences between the Neanderthal and the modern mind. And it's these things that make the hum modern human mind unique from one of its very closest relatives. I'd argue that we have what I call cognitive fluidity or capacity for metaphor uh, compared to what I call for Neanderthal's domain-specific mentality. We have compositional language, grammar, Rules of grammar, large lexicon from which we can create almost any utterance we want. I don't think Neanderthals had that. I describe them having this hom communication. I'll some reference to that moment. And thirdly, we, we have this ex remarkably extended mind. I'm surrounded by all of your bits of all of your mind, all in this auditorium. Neanderthals were very contained. Unfortunately, they kept their minds within their craniums. So let's briefly look at those. This is from my 1996 book, Prehistory of the Mind. That's a rather long time ago now, but I think the arguments still stand. That the Neanderthals on your uh, left were just thoroughly modern, like me and you, thinking about tools, thinking about technology, about material objects, thinking about the natural world, and thinking about other human beings. What they weren't so good at doing was bringing those thoughts together. These were very isolated cognitive domains. Modern humans, on the other hand, I think, because of virtue of compositional language, have this capacity for cognitive fluidity, or, in other words, a capacity for metaphor or strong analogy. Here's the, here's the difference it makes here. So um, if you see this, this, this Neanderthal chap at the bottom there, um, I don't think you could ever come up with the idea of making body ornaments, making some nice beads, because that means taking what you know about the social messages you want to send to somebody and taking what you know about making things and combining those together. I don't think he could do that. Equally, making tools to hunt specific animals in specific circumstances, it's a design task I think they lacked. In terms of uh, communication, moderns, I think, had compos compositional language, like we do, enable their cognitive fluidity. I think Neanderthals had a sophisticated form of communication, vocal communication. I think it was inherently musical in nature, and I think music is something that isn't unique to the modern mind. I think that is deeply, deeply evolved and, and shared by many types of humans. And then, and then uh, lastly, Neanderthals contain minds. We've extended ours into the material world. That's partly what all the cave paintings are about. It's partly what your iPad's about. It's partly what the beads are about. We gave up on the brain. We thought it wasn't good enough for us. We extended the minds out. And of course, um, we have a good example of there with Professor Dennett, with his mind sat on the wooden shelves behind him as much as within the cranium itself. So my very last slide, is the human mind unique? Yes, of course it is. Don't ask such a silly question. But so too is that of all species, and indeed all individuals. The difference between the human and chimpanzee mind are vast. How could it not be? There's a, there's a, there's a third, we have three times larger brain and six million years of evolutionary separation. The difference between modern humans and Neanderthals, that's a much more interesting question. I think they relate to patterns of connectivity within the brain that enable cognitive fluidity, compositional language, and extension of the mind into the material world. So thank you for listening, and many thanks again to the Carter Institution. Thank you.